Okay. So, um, good morning, everybody. I'm going to say good afternoon, but good morning on this happy, beautiful, it's a nice Monday. Um, but I want to thank you all for coming. My name is Taylor Clem. I am the Master Garden Volunteer Coordinator and our Horticulture Extension Agent with UF IFAS Extension, Nassau County. Um, so we have some people in the building with us. We also have uh, some people signed uh, through Zoom right now. Uh, but nonetheless, this is recorded. So everybody that registered, um, you will get a copy of this, this presentation. So if you want to follow up, but I'll be able to send some digital information also in the future. Um, but anyways, so part of today's program is just to help show, for those that are interested in the Master Guard Volunteer Program, we want to do this as a way to help raise awareness and what to expect going through that process to join the program. Um, and then also you'll hear a little bit about the details of that training process. And once you go through that training, what it takes, not necessarily what it takes, that's a bad word to say, but those requirements that are needed to maintain a status as a Master Gardener Volunteer. Because it's not a title that you just get and you have forever in perpetuity. It's actually a title that you work to maintain for as long as you are a Master Gardener. Um, but anyways, are there any questions anybody has before we kind of get going? Yeah, Shirley. Yeah, with for the those that are here in person, you want to do like just a quick first name introduction. I'm Laura. Laura. Mary Robin. Mary Robin. Kristen. Marsha. Well, thank you all for joining us. And we have in the back. Yeah, we have some master gardeners. <laughs> oh, um, it's good to have a good group here. Um, so the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. So what interests you all in the volunteer program? What's one of the big things that you think about? So um, even online, you can put that in the chat box. What are some of your thoughts on what interests you in the Master Gardener Volunteer Program? What have you heard about it? Yeah, you can answer, yeah. In Henry, oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And every county is different, different but the same. <laughs> We're all part of the Florida Master Guard Volunteer Program. Yeah, just kind of move and transfer over. Yeah. <laughs> we could talk more about that, but yes. Yeah. So what else? Any thoughts? Learn more. Learn Can more. I say learn more? I mean, I, I grew up in Naples. My dad had a nursery when I oh, was great. growing up. So I'm more of a South Florida girl, but I've been here for 20 years. I just kind of Mary and I've been gardening forever. Just, I think, a lifetime of gardening and, you know, sort of trying to fill in some of the blanks, things maybe that others can share with us that we may not know, even, you know, we've had our hands in the dirt our whole lives. Yeah. Um, and really to give back, you know, hopefully pass along some of the things that we know and can learn to, you know, to other people. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, what was just, so being able to share that information. So you have a background in gardening, but you know, going from the, you've been up here for twenty years is what you mentioned. Yeah. So coming up here, and we have a lot of people that come here that are new. Um, you know, even with a good experience in in gardening or just trying to get into gardening. Um, and this is a great program to start how to learn more relevant information for our area. But then also, it's a really great way with the volunteer program is you're using that knowledge to help share it with the community. So, um, and some of the, the responses that we have on here I really like is that, you know, they just love gardening and want to learn more, learning more about, uh, oops, learning more about Florida. Um, I can't get my schooling to work. Florida and conservation and how to get back to the community and just learning about different volunteering opportunities. And that's, that's the, the core, I think, of the overall program is just thinking about, it's a volunteer organization, it's a volunteer group as part of the University of Florida. And you know, our big goal is like, how can we take this knowledge and how can we take it to the community and share this information? Um, and there's so many different ways that we do that. because Every master gardener, they're all working together towards common goals, but they also have like little projects they may pick up and they can run with that allows them to have really nice big impacts within the community. So we'll go ahead and we'll jump into a little bit about what the program is, um, the background and history of it, so the program actually started in 1972, it was actually in Washington, uh, and it started with, you know, just two extension agents. And the goal was, how do we help, you know, have volunteers that can help respond to the community? Because like from a day-to-day -day basis, I could probably get 
on a slow day, 10, 15 emails. And on a really busy day, I can get up to 50. I've had one day where I had 100, but that was a weird incident. Um, that's an outlier. Uh, and not just emails, but like phone calls, walk-ins. So Master Gardeners can, so the idea is that Master Gardeners can help be that outreach to the community to help support the extension program through that horticulture education because we have such a big demand for it. So that's how this program started back in the 70s in Washington, but now it's in every single state, um, including Canada. So pretty much everywhere you go, you'll find a Master Guard Volunteer Program and it's associated with that land grant university. So for us, it's uh, University of Florida and Florida A&M. But um, the actual Florida program started actually not too far after the Washington program, it was, I can't remember who the original coordinator was that brought it to Florida, but they met the, one of the original stars of the Massacre Volunteer Program on a paddle boat in New Orleans. And then that's how the idea was like, oh, I wanna do that in Florida, that sounds fun. And then Florida started their program shortly after. Um, so the, a little bit about Master Guard Volunteers and how it relates to extension. So actually extension, land great universities, they started back um, with the Morrell Act in 1862. Um, and then in uh, 1914 is actually when they had the smith Lever Act and actually created the extension service. And that was how does extension, we are part of the university essentially that we're taking the knowledge that is gained and we're taking it to the community. Like how do we actually bring this knowledge and bring the scientific uh, information to the community. And it started out very simple. It was basic agriculture, uh, home ec specifically, and then also 4-H was a big component of it. And that 4-H youth is still a major, major component of our extension programming. We have a big 4-H program and some of our Master Guard volunteers are heavily engaged with that 4-H that program itself. So um, the extension, it provides education in three main areas, agriculture, human, natural resources, and life sciences. And it's actually a funding that's part of the states and the counties. So it's joint funding. So the master gardeners, essentially, this is the hierarchy of how it relates because our office, it's like I'm in a weird position. I have like two bosses of the university and the board of county commissioners. So, um, but the master gardeners essentially are sitting under, are within this chain of command because as master gardener volunteers, you are part of the University of Florida. It's not like you're just affiliated with the University of Florida. You are part of the University of Florida, which is kind of cool. Um, I know some people who might be like FSU fans or Georgia fans. Sometimes, you know, it may not work out too well. But I always like to joke, it's like, well, I went to University of Kentucky and now I work for the University of Florida. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, so it's one of those big things that we really like to show is Master Guard volunteers are part of the university. And that's, that's kind of neat because then that brings in a lot of those you know, great connections and resources that uni university provides, um, and it can get those uh, resources to the volunteers as well. So in the beginning, so this is stop, adopt our program is 1979, is modeled after the Washington program. The first programs were in South Florida, that day in Manatee and Brevard, um, and we had, originally had 58 volunteers that were part of our program, and now we have over like 5,000, I think, volunteers statewide. So there we go, 5,000 volunteers in, uh, in 60 counties. So we have every county is represented in the Master Guard Volunteer Program, but we have some counties because they're more rural, it might be one office serving a couple counties at one point. Um, but on average, we're almost a half a million hours, plus or minus some annually. And even during the pandemic, when we were all remote, nothing was really happening, the volunteers were actually still working. We, Obviously didn't get that half a million volunteer hours statewide, but we still had a massive impact uh, compared to what we usually do. And that usual value is about $9 million that's added just in that service that's provided alone. Um, but anyway, so there's different ways that we track our hours. We used to have this thing called uh, VMS is one page and now it's, we changed it to a new volunteer management system called Better Impact. And it's about a year old that we've been using that program. So we're still making that transition, but it's a way for us to, for like all the volunteers to be able to sign up for different activities, how to report hours, kind of like let us know what you've been working on. And, you know, so um, there's a certain level of um, 
management that goes into that because of the hour requirements that are needed for the volunteers. So let's talk a little bit about the vision and the mission of the program. So the vision ultimately is to be the most trusted resource for horticulture education in Florida. And in the world that we live in, that's actually, it's, it's harder by the day um, because of social media. So there's so many different things on social media that people are promoting and pushing that aren't actually based in science. So that can actually lead to worse things happening. And I see it day to day. It's like, I'm following a bunch of Facebook pages and recommendations where I see something that someone posts and I was like, oh no, oh no. Um, <laughs> I try not to, I don't intervene with those. But that becomes one of the battles that we have to do because there is so much misinformation that's available. And even at that, it could be great information. It just might not be relevant to Florida. So some of the things that we run into quite a bit is just planting timing. So the best time to plant tomatoes in uh, Florida is March, you know, but you can find awesome resources from other extension programs that they're gonna say, oh, you plant them in like May. June, July, I was like, no, if you do that, you'll learn, they'll turn and they'll come out as uh, sun-dried tomatoes <laughs> if they survive. Um, so there's a lot of things. So it's really important for us. Part of that outreach is a huge component because we want to make sure that we're providing going into that mission is that research-based information. So it's to assist extension agents um, in providing research-based horticulture education to Florida residents. So our, Essential the goal is what's that best information? What's that science and research-based information? And how can we help support our local community with that? Make sure that they are making the correct decisions because one wrong decision can actually lead to a huge economic impact for a homeowner. You know, it can be as simple as asking somebody to, because of Florida's landscape plants, you can actually turn your irrigation system off, let those plants establish and thrive, and then that can end up saving somebody 150, 200 bucks a month, you know, or if they irrigate improperly, it can cause disease and pests to come in and can kill their plants. I mean, do y'all, have y'all ever had to replace turf before or sod before? That's cheap, isn't it? <laughs> no. Uh, so it's one of those things where it's like, we try to make sure that we're giving people those recommendations so they can be as successful as possible. And it's really cool because it can actually have economic impacts, environmental impacts, and even social impacts. So the social benefits of having people practice in horticulture and gardening. So these are, this is our vision and our mission. So now let's talk a little bit about becoming um, uh, a Master Gardener volunteer. So as part of that training process, the training, and we'll talk about the calendar in a second, and I um, will have the calendar um, in, I have it on the PowerPoint, I'll send everyone a digital copy, but you all have a copy of that uh, calendar. But anyways, so as part of that training program, you're gonna get about 60 plus hours of education. So you can come into the Master Garden Volunteer Program and have very limited knowledge of horticulture, but you can come out of the training program with such an in-depth uh, knowledge of horticulture that you know you're almost it's almost as if you're graduating with the bachelor's of horticulture to a certain extent the bachelor's of horticulture science you learn a lot but are you anticipated to remember everything so you can regurgitate it at all times no <laughs> which is nice but the thing is it's really cool is it's part of that training you start to learn about those resources and as you start to use those resources more, more, it starts to solidify itself more and more. And then you find your little niche of things that you like to do or your key interests, and you can hone in on those. But as part of this training, it gives you that basic knowledge of horticulture. So as you start your journey as a master gardener volunteer, you have a really good foundation that you can carry on and start with. So um, you're going to get about 60 hours of training and at the end of that there is uh, an online exam um it's pretty straightforward um which is really nice but then what you have to do is that first year you have one year that you have to stay within the program after completing that training and we call you an intern at that point like a, a master guard volunteer intern and that first year you have to get a minimum of 75 volunteer hours 
And that's actually surprisingly easy. There's so many different opportunities that we provide that 75 volunteer hours you know, you can easily get in a month if you wanted to. Now you don't have to. We have some volunteers that will get over 500 in a year. It's not everybody, but some do. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I will not answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so you will, um, we'll talk about a little about those resources. So can you use, yes, essentially, because one of the things about going through this program is there is the exam. I would prefer you to do it closed book. But one of the things is all those resources are always going to be available to you anyways. So it's a really nice way to kind of like go through it and make sure that all that final information is solidified. But um, nonetheless, if you do, I can't stop you. <laughs> so it's one of those things where I sometimes say, I didn't hear that. <laughs> but anyways, so that first year, you are going to get those 75 volunteer hours. And then after completing those 75 volunteer hours and that first year, you then become a master gardener volunteer. So it's like, oh, cool. You know, so then, and then the difference between an intern and just the regular master gardener volunteer is actually nothing. It's just that annual requirement. Um, you know, there are, there is nothing that really differentiates the two outside of just that title and those requirements. Because once you become a master gardener volunteer, you go through that first calendar year and hit your 75 service hours, you know, um, then you have a new annual requirement. And that annual requirement is 35 volunteer hours each year and 10 continuing education units. And the reason that we chart, we do those 10 CEUs um, starting as volunteers is because our science is constantly changing. Our understanding is constantly changing. So we're wanting to constantly making sure that our volunteers and even myself included, that we're trying to make sure that we're on top of all the new knowledge. So we, as those recommendations change, we're making sure that we're sharing the appropriate research-based information. Um, and then obviously the first year, you don't have to get any CEUs because, well, you just did over 60 of them as part of that training program. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward process, but the biggest thing is this is showing that commitment as part of being part of that volunteer. And again, once you become the Master Guard volunteer, in order to maintain that title, you have to um, keep, you have to do 35 hours each year and 10 continuing education units. And 10 CEUs is just like you come to one advanced training or some advanced training might be a couple hours. So essentially every hour that you do of training, then that counts as a CEU. And even at that, again, our normal programs, you easily can get those CEUs because the amount of CEU opportunities that we have, not just within the county, but university-wide um, that you can attend, whether it be online, sometimes we'll do it in person, our Master Gardener Volunteer Conferences. You can easily, if you go to one state conference, you'll get more than enough CEUs um, because there's constant learning and education and that reach during those to help Master Gardener Volunteers. So there is an application process because we can only have a certain amount of people attend the training program in itself. So the application process is pretty straightforward, um, but it's just an online application. And on, uh, on the sheet of paper, and it's on the PowerPoint, I'll send it out to everybody, the digital copy, it has that schedule. But essentially, you know, we've had people filling out an interest form online, letting us know that, hey, I'm interested in the program to make sure that when the applications come out that they get a copy of that application. Um, an application is typical, di typically is digital, but if someone needs a hard copy, they can just email me and I can send them a hard copy uh, that they can print out. But the applications are going to be sent out June 15th, and you got about a month to fill them out. It's a pretty simple application, um, but they're due July 13th. And um, this year, we're only going to be able to take 15 people in the training. So um, as part of that application process, we actually do an interview. So some of the Master Gardener volunteers will actually sit with the applicants and they'll add, they have just uh, standard, standardized questions that we ask to kind of learn a little bit about the applicant. 
Um, and then we make those final selections. So the final selections, everybody will be notified at the latest by uh, around August 18th is when we do those final selections, start to notify those final selections. And then the class is actually gonna start September 8th. So, um, and with that class starting September 8th, um, one of those things that we have is once you go through the application process, there is a fee for the class. Um, and I'm putting together two tickets. There's gonna be the minimum fee for the tickets, uh, but then I'm also gonna have an extra fee for it, but it's gonna be about 200 bucks for the extra fee. And that includes a bunch of uh, other horticulture related books that are relevant for uh, master gardeners. So it's kind of a really neat way to start a library. Um, but then the base fee is just gonna be kind of like cover materials and costs and the base student learning binder as part of the program. Any questions about that? How much is the base fee? I'm still calculating it, but it's gonna be about 85 to $100. So, yes. So, all of the classes are like here or somewhere during the day, or is everything online? It's going to, so the program, um, I'll go ahead and talk about that. I think it's, it's right here. So, here's the calendar. Um, for everybody at home, it's just the visual calendar. I'll send this out to everybody. But the question was, with this program, is it going to be in person during the day? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be all online? Um, so for the training program, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do a hybrid program. So there is an online web page. Um, I'll briefly show that online teaching page. So all the modules will actually be put on this webpage and only the students or the interns have the ability to um, access this webpage and all the modules will come open on this. And this is where you can do, whoop, you all don't see it. Everybody, uh, hold on. He has a zoom advantage. How do I get to that? I know how to get to it, hold on. All right, so this is the training webpage right here. Um, let me actually go to the view of it. So this training webpage ha will have all the resources and all the modules and everything like that for the training in itself. So the idea is um, I will actually open up these different modules as we progress. So each week you would have to complete a certain number of modules and then you do that at your own pace, but then we get together in person once a week. Where we do like hands-on components and work together. And that's gonna be in the evening to try to help it, to make it more accessible for others who are working full-time uh, rather than being in the middle of the day. So it's usually gonna be, I'm trying to figure out the exact day. I usually do Sunday evenings or Monday evenings. But once we actually get closer and actually have that application selection, We'll try to pick that final day with those that are actually going through the training and kind of figure out what is the best day that works for them. So um, all the main learning is going to be through this online webpage, and it's kind of it's kind of fun because um, you kind of walk through. Oops, you walk through it, and it has information about like what you're looking at, and this coincides with your handbook that you'll get as part of the training that everybody gets, um, and. So there's like some things you have to engage with like surveys, steps to completing the module, and then it has different resource content that goes through the entire thing for each module. And they're fun. I think they're fun. So like little activities, like assessments that you have to do before and after. And then it's not just me giving all the presentations. We have other extension agents. We also have other state specialists. And there are going to be some of these state specialists as a master guard volunteer you'll be able to uh, work with or engage with. You'll have 
uh, interactions with. So it's not just me, which is really nice. But then there's like little activities and games that exist uh, within here. So it's kind of fun. But um, so that's the online learning page and it's really straightforward. And once we get closer with those, again, with those final applicants, those that are going through the program, we actually will sit down and we'll talk about this training webpage to see if there's any questions. So, and by doing it this way, it reduces our cost by like 10%. <laughs> so um, let me open up the PowerPoint again. Any questions about that um, web page, both online or at home? Oops. So does that make sense? Having just the, it's just a hybrid. So the hybrid program online and then once a week in person. And um, we've been finding that's a still a successful model where it used to be 100% in person during the day. So that actually put a limit on our volunteers. And um, now that we have this hybrid model accessible to us, it allows us to have um, a lot of different people help join the program or come join the program. And it's been, very valuable to statewide. So, um, and this is gonna be our first time offering the hybrid model in Nassau County. So we're excited about doing that. So, and this actually evolved from the pandemic essentially. So, but as part of the curriculum you go through, there's this orientation. Uh, there's a whole module about floor front and landscaping, botany, um, entomology and IPM. Uh, weed, turf grass ID, uh, turf grass, vegetable, fruit gardening, plant propagation, and citrus. Those are essentially the basics that we cover. But inside the actual manual, there's a lot more information and content. And we can actually pick up some of those extra modules if the group wants to, because there's one module that's 100% dedicated to palms if we wanted to do palms. Um, there's one module that's 100% dedicated to landscape design if we wanted to focus on landscape design. So um, there's other options that we can pick from, but these are those requirements. And the reason why this is the requirements is because um, no matter where you're at in the state, these are the topics you're gonna have to talk about. You know, Palms is a really, really great program, but there's a lot of details and information in the Palms that we'll never have to deal with in North Florida. Now, if we lived in Naples, absolutely. Um, or in South Florida, absolutely. Um, just because of our cooler temperatures. So that's why some of those modules are optional to what we do as part of learning, but these are those required modules that you'll be doing. So as part of the program, we have a bunch of different activities. Um, so one thing that I like to do is the part of the training program is I want everybody to kind of start their thinking about what am I interested in? What do I want to do as a master gardener volunteer? And you can start doing a project throughout your training and it could be individual or you can do it as a group. It could be something as simple as I want to put together a little brochure about a certain topic, or I wanna help write an education flyer about another topic, or maybe I wanna build a presentation. Um, there's a couple of different things that we can do. Um, one option that we do have this year, uh, the right after we finish training, we actually is when the county fair is starting. And if we wanted to, even as a group, we can instead do a big tabling, like how to design the table and display that maybe we'll wanna have at the fair this year. Um, so there's a lot of different activities as, that we have within that education. Now, of course, the actual volunteer activities, there's a whole slew of things. But um, as well as when you're going through the intern process that first year, I always think about like mentorship programs. I don't want you all to think it's like, oh, we go through this training and then what do we do now? My goal is to help match you with different Master Gardener volunteers that they can be kind of like that point of contact that you can always reach out to, but to really think of like, how can they help answer some of those questions that you may have, as well as how can they help connect you to some of those programs or those projects or activities that might be happening at the same time. So uh, it's kind of like becomes an accountability partner. Our goal is to help as a way, so as you finish training, 
you can kind of get plugged into the program. Because one of the things that we usually see is if you're doing these fall trainings, what happens right after we finish the training? It's like the holiday period. And then, so our goal is after the training, try to make sure that we're staying involved through the holiday period because our actual, most of our attrition happens during that holiday gap. So if we make sure that we're having programs and activities, not necessarily, it's like, oh, it's Christmas day, come out and volunteer. Absolutely not, you know, but we want to make sure that we're staying engaged and plugged in. So um, because that time of year is pretty slow for us regardless, but because of that, we want to make sure that the groups are staying engaged and um, trying to make sure that all those that go through the training are plugged in. Because our, what we don't want is someone to go through the training and disappear. Um, because that could have been somebody that could have gone in and then stayed through the training and volunteered, you know, but then also we hate when that happens because we think that maybe we didn't do something appropriate to help stay them and keep them engaged enough with the program. So um, I, that's why I like that mentorship program because it kind of helps make sure that you all are engaged and not just in that period, but through that entire time that you're going through your first year as a volunteer. Yes. Yeah, so the question, the question is on the schedule, there's something about uh, final presentations. Um, and that's like if we do those projects. So it's that like November meeting ends up becoming our big planning meeting for the year. So that'll be the great way to kind of plug those new master gardeners that have gone through the training here's our first meeting together so you can see all meet all the other volunteers that you probably haven't met yet or some of the others and immediately get engaged so if we end up doing those projects that would be a great opportunity for you to kind of like you get to stand up introduce yourself but then also you get to introduce briefly like what you did as your project so because then what that does is those master gardeners like oh that's a cool project that's something i'm really interested in so all of a sudden it becomes an, a really neat way to network with all those other volunteers so, good question. Yes, Carl. Oh, yeah, we have a new building. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was here. So, um, our, and, no, it's not open yet. So, we do have a new building. Um, so, we actually have two offices in Nassau County, our current office. Our main office is in Callahan at the fairgrounds. Um, and that's been our HQ for, for as long as I know. Um, and the, this office we call our Uli Annex. This has been here for 15 years, about that long, about 15 years. Just so allows us to make sure that you all know how long, like say you're in Bryceville and you had to drive out to here to be your extension office, or you live in Ferndia Beach and you gotta drive out to Callahan. That could be an hour one way. Um, so we had these buildings kind of act like satellite nodes. So now what's happening is we have a new office that's opening up on Minor Road. And that office on Minor Road is, um, we're gonna close this, this will move from this building and our Uli building will become Minor Road and the Minor Road property will become our actual main extension office, but we'll still have the Callahan office open as well. So we'll keep that one open. We'll have a 4-H agent over there. Our agriculture and natural resource agent will be there. But also we have, as part of our training opportunities, not training opportunities, but our volunteer opportunities is our help desk. So that is opportunity where clients in the community, they can call in and they can actually speak with Master Gardener volunteers. And we actually have that available at both offices. So we do that so volunteers on no matter which side of the county can easily get to an office they can volunteer at. Um, for in-office activities. So, but yeah, we have that office opening up any day soon, any day now. So it just, you know, our ribbon cutting is on June 10th and theoretically we'll have a certificate of occupancy for that. <laughs> so yes, ma'am. So on Minor Road, I can never remember the address off the top of my head, but it's Caddy. 85831, that's it, Minor Road, yeah. It's it's a uh, caddy corner from that Ace it's Hardware. Right the yeah, so it's right there, yeah. So it's located, it's the new extension office is lo located. I would say caddy corner from that Ace because pretty much everyone, I, most people know where that Ace is. Okay. 
So, yeah. So we should have a sign out on the road soon. Uh, a little bit more way for better wayfinding, but we're excited to be able to move in that project, that property. Um, because we have a pond on the property, we have a nature trail, um, we have a lot of more space out on that property than we have at either of the current extension offices that we can use. So one thing that we love about the fairgrounds is they give us some area to play, you know, and do some things outside, but this gives us a little bit better control over what we can do for our programs as well. So, so let's talk about like that post-graduation or that after that volunteer time or that training time. It's important to know that the learning never ceases as a Master Gardener volunteer. The minute that you stop learning, you know, you're not being able to fulfill the mission of a Master Gardener volunteer. Continual, lear continual learning is key. You know, um, I mean, how the Master Gardeners, you on the back, has things stayed the same since you've become a Master Gardener volunteer? Yeah, Carl. Uh, I got nose. <laughs> the other day, Taylor did a class on irrigation, and I was helping him put stuff together and listening. The information he provided was there was more, uh, and it, it actually added a lot more in the course of the seven years, and I even got more into that. Taylor was saying this program evolved constantly, and as So um, for everyone on Zoom, what Carl mentioned was um, one of our volunteers, I, I just say Carl, like they know you, <laughs> some may know you, <laughs> uh, but one of the volunteers mentioned is the, <laughs> is that, you know, just this past weekend, he mentioned that he came to the irrigation workshop that we had, and even at that, he's learned so much more compared to the previous times, but then thinking about, and this is a very true part of that statement, as as our county changes, our needs change. And in extension, we're needs-based. And our goal is to how do we address the needs of our community? And if we're not addressing the needs of our community within the capacity of a Master Guard volunteer, are we being successful with what we're doing? So, um, and that's, that's an important part to think. And what was the last part that you said, Carl? It's the level of Oh, yeah. So a lot of the instructors that we have come to the program, they're not just, you know, an agent like me, <laughs> um, but like some of these state specialists, they're, they're professors, you know, they're the ones doing the research, you know, we'll have some come from the University of Florida, like on campus, but we have a research center that's out in Live Oak. That shoo, that place is fun to go to, or you've been there? Yeah, yeah during the open houses. So the quality of instructors that you all get, you're going to get at such a level that the typical community is not going to have. So you're going to be able to, there'll be times where you'll, you'll be on first name basis with some of these professors, like, hey, we're doing this program. I had some interest, like, can you help me try to figure out what's the best way that we can kind of educate the community on our native bird species? And what are some cool ways that we can educate that to youth or kids or adults or, you know, anything. And you can reach out to like me, obviously, but then they can become part of those key players and roles that can help support projects that we're working on. But also they come and help provide that education for you all, which is really fun. Yes. All the ages work together. It's not just Taylor that's on campus. I do that from Taylor's and that's and the statement was um you know that it's not just me the agent here we have multiple agents in our office i'm a horticulture agent but You'll have that interaction with Duval County, Baker County, Orange County, Citrus County. It doesn't matter. And you 
they can be people that you reach out to. I get phone calls from other eight, from other volunteers from other counties. You know, we're in our individual county, but we're all in one big statewide program and we're all working together in like a really neat way. And that's a cool kind of interaction that doesn't actually happen in some other state programs. We have a really robust state program. I'm not being biased when I say that. We have a really good one. <laughs> one other thing, I don't want you to get intimidated or scared because of the level of the instruction you can get in that garden format. Tremendous amount of information. And to, to focus on it, to learn, to move forward, don't let any of it ever frighten you if you don't understand a lot of people who will help. We always still do that. <laughs> Yeah, so um, what, was, what was mentioned was don't feel intimidated by the information, the knowledge of things that you learn. Um, the resources are always at your fingertips and our goal isn't necessarily for you to be able to regurgitate everything that we share, you, share with you, but you learn how to find those resources. Have you ever heard that statement where someone says, I know a guy who knows a guy? Well, you'll end up becoming that person. You know, where it's like, oh, I have a gardening question. Who do I go to? Oh, I'm going to go to one of the Master Gardener volunteers because they know how to find those resources to help me find those resources. And like, I don't know everything. I learn a lot from the Master Gardener volunteers because they have their interests. And they say, Taylor, I was reading this really cool thing that I found. Did you know this? I'm like, no, I didn't know that. That's really neat. <laughs> so, um, so it really, you know, we find that we're, there is a lot of content that we can learn but it's really a social thing more than anything. And like what I would like to tell, um, when I'm talking about community gardens, I always say community first, gardening second. And that's the same thing with the Master Gardener volunteers is we're community first and gardening second. So it actually becomes a really cool social network where you know, some of your great friends will come out of the Master Gardener volunteers or you'll meet some lifetime friends through this. Um, so it's a really cool program for, us personally, but also you get to do some really fun things for the community as well. So, but as part of that learning, you know, we have county trainings at our meetings, advanced trainings that happen. Um, we have different conferences. We have our national conference, international conferences, regional conferences, um, and we also do different field trips as a group. So we have these just continual learning opportunities throughout the year. Other training opportunities is the Master Gardener Volunteers. Actually, we have a leadership school for volunteers and that's on those even number years. Um, and we have one this summer, it's in August, I believe. Um, but it really targets that county leadership of those Master Gardener Volunteers and usually two to three Master Gardeners from each county attend. So we have various field trips at those research days. Uh, our research centers, like I mentioned, we have the uh, research facility over in uh, Live Oak. Um, and they do some really, really neat things and they have open houses. We can have special tours. I like to actually schedule a tour as part of our training program to go out there because they have trans and trailers that they hook up and they pull around on tractors and you're going out to see what they're growing out in the fields and all the cool things that they're doing. So like they're doing a lot of research on tea, hydroponics, and they're also doing some really cool research on like how nutrients are leaching in agriculture fields. Um, so those opportunities never cease to exist. So we have different short, short courses and master gardener specific trips. About four or five years ago, there was a group of master gardener volunteers from across the state that actually went to Italy. And they went to Italy to learn about how agriculture and food is in Italy. And like the, the idea is to try to pick different countries around the world where they can kind of explore how agriculture is different. So that was, did any of you go on that trip? I didn't, <laughs> but, um, but the photos were really cool. <laughs> but um, anyways, but it's the master gunners stay connected. Like I mentioned, it's a social thing. 
So emails, we have websites uh, that we can communicate, not just with one another, but with the community, social media, um, different webinars, newsletters, et cetera. So overall, the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, it's really robust. And ultimately, you know, we have our county program that we're running and we're working together, but we're part of a much larger statewide system. And then as that, the community's needs change, so does our programs change. But the core of all of it, it's that research-based information and how we are sharing that as outreach to our community. So any questions from anybody? And I'll make sure I repeat questions for everybody on uh, through Zoom that's asked here and then vice versa. When did the courses, when did the hours start? The, once the course is over, those volunteer hours start pretty much that uh, after that exam period. So you technically have a full calendar year and then a couple months. So, um, so the training, so essentially you have through 2023 to get your 75 hours, but by where we finish, you're getting that little buffer time right after the training. So essentially you have like 13 and a half months, 14 months technically. But as soon as we finish the training, you can start working on your volunteer hours. And we, I credit those. Yeah, yes ma'am. volunteer hours spent doing stuff with the group? I mean, like, do you, if somebody asks you questions and wants you to look at their yard and answer questions for them, does any of that count for your hours? Great question. So the question was, you know, are the hours only things that we're doing as a group? Or can it be something like maybe you're working with someone in your community that might be asking you specific questions and you're working with them? So yes to both. So we have a big thing of multiple projects. So like on our volunteer website where you can sign up, there are dozens of opportunities. It could be part of helping come run this program. Um, it can be going to schools to help educate, working with a 4-H club to help teach them about butterflies. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, you do go to someone in the community and you go to their home and help answer questions for them to kind of do like an on-site visit. But um, usually what we do is everything that is on the volunteer calendar of opportunities, you can sign up and you can attend those, no problem. But anything that's outside of that, you just have to get approval from me um, to make sure that what you're working on counts. So just like having a discussion with someone at the grocery store doesn't count, <laughs> you know? You know, and I like where I live, I like actually try not to tell everybody what I do, you know, because I don't want them to like, Taylor, talk about Taylor, talk about this. <laughs> um, so that's a really good question. But yeah, we have a bunch of volunteer opportunities, but there are a lot of like individual things. So we have some master gardeners that like, oh, I just hang out my house and I'm going to help write some publications because they love being able to write. So they just maybe make a brochure, or, you know, um, and those are things that we just kind of like coordinate together. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities that you that we have as an overall group, but then there's all these little side projects that are kind of happening at the same time. And do those still count and re we record them? Oh, fun. And, um, so, you know, my grandkids want to know and other kids do too. And so, yeah, so I absolutely. So she, uh, what was her name again? Vicky. Vicky. Ah, yes, I remember. <laughs> um, Vicki mentioned that she's been rearing monarchs for the past few years, um, and she likes being able to share that and like watch them grow, et cetera. Vicki, I want to introduce you to Beverly McNair. Um, <laughs> Beverly is working with uh, Kelsey Irvine, our 4-H agent, because one of our goals is to actually take that program into schools uh, so we can take butterflies into schools so classrooms can learn about rearing butterflies and that growth and lear learning about what's needed for butterflies, it's like pollinator gardens, host plant, nectar sources, et cetera. So yes, absolutely. So um, we also have embryology, if you wanna take eggs to classrooms, um, not many volunteers happen with that, but, but our office gets swarmed with hundreds of chickens in the spring. Um, I don't even know, when I say hundreds, we've probably had 500 chickens come through our office this year. Because <laughs> we take all eggs out to schools and they put in incubators and they watch them grow in the eggs and then they all hatch. And once they hatch, they come back to our office. <laughs> so uh, one, one of the ladies in our office, Holly, she has said, um, 
you know, when I started working in extension, I did not think that I would be doing as much as I do right now. And she loves it. You know, she's like, I've never worked in an office where it's like, I've had to help, you know, weigh pigs. <laughs> so, um, so there's, there's a big variety of things that we have happen in our office, which is really fun. It's never day is the same. No day is ever the same. Um, one question that we have online is if your active status expires, due to failure to maintain education hours or volunteer hours, how do you get reinstated? So there are certain times when, if you have the inability to maintain or receive your hours, um, there are times when it's like, I see you working and you're trying to get those hours, but life happens and sometimes prevents you from getting those hours. We do have a status that we just put it in as inactive or, you stay active and I just allow you to keep working, but you have to be shown that you're working, trying to work towards it. Um, but there are times when if, you, if you're not working towards the hours, we're not seeing you do projects or you're not staying engaged. And um, then that status is at that point, we typically say, well, you know, thanks for your time and effort, but this might not be the best fit. Um, so, we like to make sure that we have those hours, but we do know that there are situations in life where it prevents people from getting their hours because of what might be happening. So we usually do a case by case basis. So like obviously during the pandemic, I had no hour requirements because I didn't think that was reasonable for us to do. Um, and that was statewide, we didn't do that. Um, so those are the types of things that we're looking for. Um, you know, like there are some volunteers, it's like, I see them working really, really hard, especially that first year. And then say they get 74 hours and not 75. I'd be like, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyways, so there are times that we do it case by case, but usually if a master gardener goes inactive because we're just not seeing them in the program, we usually um, remove them from the program. Um, because we have resources and RN that goes into maintaining the volunteers. Um, so therefore, unless we only want to make sure that we're putting our efforts into those that are staying active in the program. Um, so that's a really um, good question. Oh, and a follow up question is, say someone goes inactive um, because of, I'll say in two situations. So it says they're talking about years, not necessarily months. Um, so there are some situations where if you're out for a, a month or so, no problem, you can come back. We talk about it, but if you go inactive for a couple years and you weren't really involved with the program, we would actually say you have to go through the application process and start the whole thing over again. But actually at that point, there's a really low chance that you would get accepted if we, if we knew that someone went active because it was just due to inactivity in the program. Because again, resources that go into it. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and you can actually transfer, transfer your status and membership. Uh, in the state, it's really easy to do. So say like you're in West Palm Beach County or West Palm County, and you move up here and it's like, hey, Taylor, I just moved up from West Palm. I'm like, cool, let me just reach out to your coordinator get some info and then bam, you're part of our county program. It's really, really easy. But say you have a long time go past, like you move up here and it's been like four years since you've gone through the training, then, or that you made that move, then we might end up saying, we'll just have you go through that, the training again to get you caught up, assuming you get a good reference from your previous coordinator. And even sometimes a lot of people move here from out of state. Um, and usually if it's out of state and they're in good standing where they're coming from, um, then we usually accept them. Uh, if they're in like this one, like Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, it's usually, yeah, come ahead and join. We may just make sure you take these classes this year to kind of make sure you're up to speed on like Florida horticulture. But like, say you come here from Ohio um, and you want to do the program, we'll say you'll have to go through the training just because of how different it is. So there's like a lot of the little exceptions that we have to make in judgment judgments, but those are actually pretty relatively standardized statewide. So, but at least in state movement is very, very easy to do, which is nice. Um, so um, anyways, and again, that training, it is starting September 8th 
and it will end up essentially ending at that uh, first meeting in no uh, sorry the training goes September 8th and it's going to end um, mid October on the 21st and uh, that first meeting that we're going to have together I think is that uh, November 9th it's the second Wednesdays of the month right yeah <laughs> so November 9th is going to be that first meeting that we have it together but that's just when the training ends so actually you have yeah, about uh, November and December sometimes that you can start actually working on those hours. So, any other questions? In a minute, yeah, in a minute. Okay, so yeah, my question Yes. So with those modules, essentially, I open them up on like Sunday and you have that whole week to finish those modules. So um, and then the next modules, but you have to complete them that week. I have so like to show that you're completing the modules online, there's activities that are actually in each module. And I'm tracking through those. There's actually little assessments. They're not graded quizzes, but there are assessments that you do at the beginning and end of each module and some other activities. And I can track who's doing what through that way. So, you do online. yeah, all those activities that are on that web page, I'm tracking that data so I can see who's completing them. And they're basic things like a Google quiz where you just type in your name and you answer all the questions, and then bam, I have the data. So, um, that's how I'm tracking making sure that's getting completed. Yeah. So I may be uh, in Gilroy, but we go October 9th, and I think we come back on the 17th. So if I did that, and I'm like, like I can't do a group, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to uh, keep it online. So that, that's a good question. So there are, um, the question was if we miss, if you like missing modules because of vacation or travel. So that is fine. Um, our goal is to not miss more than one week because then you find falling really far behind. But we actually have built into this schedule that week of October 16th to the 21st is actually a makeup week where you can finish any modules that we actually built into there. But if you end up missing more than that, you end up missing so much content, it's actually hard to catch back up. Um, so as long as ahead of time, we know if you're gonna be missing due to something like that, we can make sure we plan around it. Yeah. That's a very good question. Oh, here's one is, can you go ahead in modules? So no. You can't. So um, I'll only release the modules once they're available for that week. So on week one, it's only gonna be like the orientation module. And then uh, that's actually what opens up on September 8th. And then on the 11th, I open up the next two, uh, three modules. On the, the schedule I give you, it shows you those modules as they open. I have to make sure the dates are correct though. I think they are. Um, so that, yeah, that first week on the 8th, you'll have the orientation and the Florida Friendly Landscaping module. And then the subsequent weeks, you can see how they all fit together. So, but no, you can't go ahead and schedule because we want to make sure everyone's staying on track because then that relates to our in-person activities that what we're going to do that week. Yes, Shirley. Oh, absolutely. So uh, one of the master gardeners asked if they had access to that. And yes, that you will, you will have access to that. I'll give that to the master gardeners, but so you can watch the videos and all that stuff. It'd be really nice. But you don't have to do the engagement of the activities assessments. <laughs> so we do not do the monthly meetings and that's what we actually do them just every other month. So we have bi-monthly meetings. Um, they're happening on the second Wednesday of each month. And we have our Landscape Matters program. So it's twice a month. We have a community education program. And our meeting actually coincides with that Landscape Matters program. So we have Landscape Matters. And then afterwards, the Master Gardeners just hang out. And then we do our business meeting. 
So then the CEU is part of the, uh, that community program. So it allows us to have a big, continue that impact and having to um, coordinate slightly less. <laughs> a great question. But yeah, we do our meetings bi-monthly. We have an advisory group of master gardeners and they are kind of help as a general steering committee. So we can like kind of like what's our big needs within the program? How do we make sure we're addressing them? How do we think about moving forward in the future with our next decisions and planning? So, um, so there's leadership opportunities within the group as well. So the question is, is there an estimated amount of time to dedicate to module per week? So it depends on the module, but usually it takes somewhere between, some take 30 minutes, some will take about 90 minutes. So, um, and I tried to break it up. So the, um, the modules, you should be staying around three to four hours a week on that training. So, but it just depends on the time that you can dedicate to it. So um, I obviously, if I was going through this training with my two boys, I have a four month old and an 18 month old, it'd be a little bit piecemeal. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 This is set up so you can pause it and leave it and come back to it later and then finish. Just pick up right off, pick up where you left off. So, which is a, a nice thing about this because there's some, some online ways that you can do it where once you leave, you have to start back over. But um, all of our volunteer training statewide, we have it, whether on this system or other systems, that it is. Um, when you need it. It's not like it's gonna be a live thing where it's like you have to join this class and speak with everybody. So, um, but it's 100%, you can come back to it when needed if you have to leave. So. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us online and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the program. Um, can't wait to meet you all. We will be sending out those applications starting um, next month, June 15th. And it's just gonna be a digital link um, through Qualtrics is what we call it, but it's just a digital form that we have. And I'll have all the, uh, the basic information and questions that's required as part of our application process. Um, but if you do want to have a um, hard copy, please let me know and I can send that to you. So thank you everybody. And thank you for joining us. Take care.